Um, before I get started, I really just want to take a minute, this is the one I use, um, to thank everyone who uh, has helped with this research. So uh, my entire dissertation research has taken place, all my field work here at Stone Lab in the research lab. I have stuff still going on. Um, I want to thank everyone here. Also, I want to point out that um, two REU students have helped me with this research, and we're actually, we have a publication in revision, uh, Caroline McElwain from two years ago, and Andy Opliger, who actually is here again in the back. He's working as a tech this summer up here on the lake. So really just another reason to take advantage of these sorts of opportunities when they come your way. Um, so a little background on me. Um, this slide decided not to be animated. That's fine. Um, so in high school, I got a job as a fish technician at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Uh, I come from a fishing family, so it made a lot of sense to work uh, in fisheries. So I worked for the commercial fin fish division, and my job was to sit in, to, sit in a dark room and watch videos of fish swimming upriver. Uh, so we were doing salmon escapement monitoring, and that was the most boring job I've ever had in my life. Um, because it was 40 hours a week of watching fish swim. Uh, but that led to a lot of really good opportunities. It led to a lot of field seasons where I was living in a tent with bears for months at a time. Again, still counting fish going up river, uh, but getting more hands-on experience. Um, and then I went and got a bachelor's degree in biology and environmental science where I decided I wanted to be a forestry major for a while um, and then an economics major. I was very indecisive. Um, I worked for a couple summers pulling weeds on an invasive weed crew. Um, it was terrible. Plants aren't for me. I love fish. I went back to my true passion, um, and I got a master's degree in marine biology from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I actually did research on the effects of climate change on herring in Norway. So I got to go to Norway and work on a commercial fishing boat for a few weeks. Um, mostly it was doing some modeling work, so it was a lot of staring at a computer. Um, after that, I worked at Hub SeaWorld, which is the research arm of SeaWorld. Uh, this job was a lot of working in aquaculture, but also a lot of scrubbing pens with dolphins in them. Um, it was great, and I loved it. Uh, I love being out on the water. I love working with fish. But I found that the things I wanted to do required me to get a PhD. Um, so uh, part of what I was doing at Hub SeaWorld was working on gas saturation in the eyes of fish, uh, which was causing blindness. Um, Got really interested in vision, and then I managed to find an advisor here in Ohio. Um, so I came out here all the way from California. I was in Ohio for three days before I came up to Stone Lab and spent uh, three months up here doing research. So this is my first little dose of Ohio. Holds a really special place in my heart. Um, this is my first summer up here uh, working on the in our lab. Um, we're still here. so. And we've managed to expand the research project. We have uh, two undergrads up here this summer working with us, and it's pretty exciting. Um, so my research really focuses, freshwater reed ecosystems are experiencing drastic anthropogenic change. And so we really want to understand how these are affecting aquatic organisms. So this can be change anything from algal blooms, pollution, uh, whatever is going on down here in this picture. Sorry, it's, my PowerPoint's a little cut off for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and uh, chemical pollutants, all sorts of things are causing these freshwater ecosystems to experience drastic change. And so one question we want to ask is how are animals coping with this human-induced change? So one way we can ask it is ask how can they perceive it? Because if an animal can't really perceive a stressor, it's not really going to be able to cope with that stressor. So fish have a variety of ways to cope with these environmental stressors to sense them. So from these are the same senses we have. They have an extra one, the lateral line. Um, but what we're really looking at is vision in this. So I, I work on how animals use their vision to sense these stressors and how they can overcome these stressors. The stressor I primarily work with is turbidity. Um, and this can take a variety of forms. Turbidity is just the suspension of particulates in the water column. Um, it can be inorganic sedimentary turbidity. So that's you know, after a big storm event, the water is murky. It's a little chocolate brown, chocolate milk color. Um, that's inorganic sedimentary turbidity. But there's also algal turbidity, which is caused by an increase in nutrients causing algal bloom. Um, in Lake Erie, both of these types of turbidity can be a problem. So this is a picture from April in 2015, I believe, 
of a really big sediment plume in the western basin of Lake Erie. Um, and here's a photo from October 2011, um, which was a pretty massive algal bloom that happened up here. So fish that live in these aquatic systems, they have to be able to cope with these stressors because they're subjected to them almost every year. Um, turbidity causes a variety of effects on fish. Uh, it can increase ventilation rate. It can damage, physically damage gill structures. It can change invertebrate communities, which will change the ability of them, for a fish to find prey that they are, are willing to consume. Um, it can decrease growth rate. It can also smother and reduce hatching success of eggs, which is really important. And it can also alter schooling behaviors, which can increase the likelihood of being predated upon. Um, but what turbidity also does is it changes the underwater visual environment. So in a clear ocean or lake on a really nice day, you might get light penetration down to about 75 meters. You're losing red wavelengths of light first, but you're getting these shorter blue wavelengths of light at the bottom. So if you all remember in Finding Nemo when they go deep and it loses the red, um, this is kind of what that's like. So this is the normal spectrum of light that happens in a clear ocean or lake. But in an algal bloom, oh, you can't really see it. There's a scroll button. Where? Oh. There we go. That makes more sense. So, um, in an algal bloom, you're going to get penetration of light maybe to only about 25 meters. Um, and you're also going to get a shift from these shorter wavelengths to a longer wavelength of light in these blue-greens. And really what we're trying to see is how this change in the underwater environment is actually affecting the ability of fish to find prey or avoid predation. Now this button isn't working. I'm so sorry. I'm bad at technology. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, I hit the wrong button. So um, we know that a fish's visual range, sorry, sorry for that. A fish's visual range is everything they can see. They use this to find things like food. When sedimentary turbidity happens, any type of turbidity, that's going to reduce the visual range, which we're not really sure how that's going to affect the ability for a fish to find food. But what we have to really think about is not only thinking about how turbidity affects their visual range, fish's visual range, but also how different, I broke it again. There we go. But we also have to think about how different types of turbidity are going to differentially affect the ability of this fish to find food. So really the question we're asking is, how do fish see in these different visual environments and how do algal and sedimentary turbidity affect vision specifically? So we know um, from some light research that we have that um, on this graph there's wavelengths of light on the X and then light intensity, so how intense and bright that light is on the Y. Um, the blue line on top, that's showing a clear body of water. Um, the next line, the brown one, that's sediment. So that's just reducing overall light, but it's not really changing those wavelengths that are present. However, algal turbidity is going to further reduce the amount of light and also shift it to these longer wavelengths. We're not really sure what the consequences of that are. So visual ecology is what we use to ask these sorts of questions. Um, and this is just the study of how visual systems are specialized and function to meet these ecological needs of the fish. So this is everything from finding food, finding mates, and also avoiding predators. Within visual ecology, we have this toolbox of specific tools we can use to ask, how is this fish seeing? You can't just ask a fish to you know, read the 
letters on the I chart, we have to use behavioral proxies to answer these really important questions. So um, for my research, I'm looking at three, uh, visual sensitivity, visual acuity, and visual foraging. So visual sensitivity is just the ability to perceive contrast. So can you tell the difference between a black and white bar? And we test this using the optomotor response. Visual acuity, that's sharpness of vision. That's when you're at the eye doctor reading the eye chart. Um, that we test with a proxy called reaction distance. And then visual foraging, that's actually the ability for an animal to find prey, find and consume prey. And we test that using consumption rate. And I'll get into more of these in detail. All of these in detail. So the first fish species we looked at was emerald shiner. Uh, this is schooling planktivora. It's a pretty important fish up here, except for in the last couple of years when they've been incredibly hard to find. Um, they're pretty important trophic forage fish in, this, in Lake Erie. And previous research has found that they have a decrease in prey consumption. So they're eating less food in turbid conditions in stream. The, no one really has looked into their ability to see in algal turbidity, just in sedimentary turbidity. So this is a fish where we know that sedimentary turbidity affects it, but we don't really know how much. We also looked at the walleye, which is a very economically important type of ore. I'm sure most of you have probably tried it, and if not, you should, because it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the reasons we wanted to look at walleye is because they have these specialized visual structures that are adapted to low light conditions. So I don't know if you've seen the eye shine in a walleye or in a cat. Um, it's the same uh, structure. So it's called a tapetum lucidum, and it's a reflective layer of tissue behind the retina that reflects the light that, doesn't, that hasn't hit a cone back onto those cones in the retina in order to maximize the amount of light that the fish is able to see. So they're able to see in really low light conditions, and they're also very sensitive to bright light conditions. So we use these two fish to ask, how do sedimentary and algal turbidity affect the vision differently? And we expect that sedimentary and algal are not the same. They're going to be different. We just don't know how. We also want to ask how these visual effects are different in fish of different trophic levels. So the interaction of a emerald shiner with a daphnia prey item is going to be wildly different from the interaction between a walleye and an emerald shiner. There's different uh, foraging strategies, and there's also different properties of the prey that make it visually different to see. So the first thing we test is that visual sensitivity, that's that ability to see contrast. And we use uh, a measure called the visual detection threshold. So this is the level of the turbidity at which the fish cannot tell contrast anymore. And so just to explain this a little better, um, on the left here, there's a black and white box. And obviously, the black and white, very different, very contrasting. When the turbidity increases, it moves to more what the middle box looks like, where it's harder to tell the difference between the two until the visual detection threshold, which is the box on the right, where the fish can no longer tell the difference between the black and the white box. So we do this using an innate response called the optokinetic response, which is the optokinetic response is the eye flicker that happens innately in most mammals when they see a moving black and white stimulus. So they actually test this in people by flashing black and white bars in front of them. It's kind of trippy freaks me out a little bit. Um, but we test this in an optomotor apparatus, which is a cylindrical tank with a black and white rotating screen. Uh, we place the fish in the center, and because of that optokinetic response, the fish will innately just follow the moving black and white screen as it spins around the tank. Um, fish will do it for two and a half hours. They'll just follow the moving screen. So what we did is we had a small tank for shiners that moved at six rotations per minute. We uh, would put the shiner in at clear water and we'd increase the turbidity up to the point where it could no longer see. And we did the same with walleye in a 12 inch tank and then now we're working with adult walleye on this. So walleye that have already recruited into the fishery. Um, each fish we tested uh, under each turbidity twice. So they've underwent a total of six trials, um, which is, it's a lot for a fish. Um, emerald shiners, I don't know if you've ever worked with them. They're very sensitive. You look at them wrong and they die. So um, the sample size is low, but it's low because in behavioral work, that's pretty normal. Um, so this is a video, if I can, like, 
to make it work. I'm so sorry. I'm so bad at technology. I don't know. Um, so this is what it looks like in action. So there's a moving screen, and the little emerald shiner will follow. Um, and then we would increase the turbidity. So this is what sedimentary trials look like. And then uh, also what the algal trials look like. Up to the point, obviously these aren't detection thresholds. The fish isn't stopping. He's still swimming, following. Um, our original apparatus was built out of a record player. <laughs> but we've moved up in the world to microwave turntable motors um, and lots of this size. So what we're finding with this is that uh, for Emerald Shiner on the left, the figure shows the sediment and algae treatment. Um, and we measured detection threshold in NTU. NTU is just a measure of level of turbidity. Um, and what we found is that the detection threshold for Emerald Shiner is about half in algae what it is in sediment. So in uh, the sedimentary treatment, our average was about 75. NTU, so that's a pretty high level of turbidity. It's not something super common in the Western Basin. Um, however, the algal turbidity was around 40 NTU, which can be seen if there's a pretty intense bloom. Uh, we also did a subset of fish where we tested them in a combination treatment, a mixture of algae and sediment, because that does happen in nature, and we wanted to see what that was like. And we found that that happened, that fell just pretty much right in the center between the sediment and algal turbidity. We also did this with walleye. Um, this is re the results from the juvenile walleye we tested last year. Um, and we found really similar results. We did find that the detection threshold in the sedimentary turbidity was a lot higher for walleye than it was for emerald shiner. Uh, but it was about the same for the combination in algal treatments. And what this is showing us is that algal turbidity causes the fish to lose their ability to detect that contrast much sooner, at much lower levels. So it's affecting the fish at lower levels, which is probably not very good for the fish. Um, but really, that doesn't give us a lot of insight into how this is causing the fish to change its behavior or causing ecological changes. So then we wanted to look at acuity. That's the sharpness of vision. That's reading the eye chart at the doctor. Different species have different visual acuity. So humans, we have great acuity. We can see all the details on this flower, as compared to a western honeybee who at the same distance is just an orange blob. And what we want to know is at what distance can the western, at what distance do you have to be to be able to figure out what an object is. So we measure this using reaction distance. So this is the maximum distance at which a fish can perceive a stimulus object. So how far away is he before he notices that's food, I want to eat it um, in this instance. So to do this, we placed a fish in a test chamber behind an opaque barrier, and we placed a prey item behind a clear barrier. Uh, we would, for the turbidity treatments, raise the turbidity to 20 NTU, which is a pretty uh, regular level of turbidity that's seen after storm events. Um, after 30 minutes, we would remove this opaque barrier, and we would measure the distance at which the fish oriented and went for the prey item. So we used Emerald Shiner as prey item for walleye, and we used Daphnia as prey item for uh, Emerald Shiner. And what we found, so the reaction distance in clear water for an Emerald Shiner is about 40 centimeters. An Emerald has to be about 40 centimeters away from a Daphnia before it will see it and try to grab it. And it went to about half that in each of our turbidity treatments. So we know that while algal turbidity affects these fish at a much lower level, at this steady level of 20 NTU, the effects are about the same across the board for all treatments. We also then tested a subset of 10 fish at an additional uh, turbidity level of 40 NTU, which is right around that detection threshold for algal turbidity. And what we found for this subset was that the higher level of turbidity didn't really make a difference. So the uh, reaction distance didn't really change from 20 to 40 NTU, except for in the sediment for our subset. Um, at 20 NTU, which we're not really sure why that is because it wasn't seen in our full data set. And we also did this with walleye. So we did this with a wild caught walleye that were, every single one was caught in a science trawl at Stone Lab. Um, so their reaction distance is about 50 centimeters. 
uh, in clear water, and it drops down to about half that in algal and algal and sediment, but it doesn't drop down as much in that sedimentary treatment, which is again showing the sediment isn't impacting these fish as much as algal turbidity is for their visual processes, which we would expect because they do have those low light adaptations that maybe are allowing the sediment to be not as much of an impediment to them as opposed to algal, which their low light adaptations aren't really able to cope with. We also did this with a, sub, with a group of hatchery fish in the winter, and we found that there was really no difference across treatments, uh, no matter what. We also wanted to test the subset of hatchery fish at a higher NTU level, so again, 20 and 40, and we found that that higher level of turbidity, that 20 didn't, the 40 didn't really make a difference. So whatever uh, problems are caused by turbidity and their ability to see their visual acuity, it's not really impacting them differently at 40 NTU than it is at 20 NTU, but it is definitely impacting them as compared to when they're in clear water. What, another thing we also really found is we wanted to know, does size of the fish matter? So uh, fish have a fixed pupil, which means that it doesn't change. So our pupils dilate in the sunlight, their pupils stay the same size. So it makes sense, you have a bigger pupil, more light comes in, you're better able to cope with this these changes in light intensity. And what we found for uh, the hatchery walleye was that yes, size did matter. So we standardized eye size to fish size. So this isn't just like bigger fish on the right. Um, this is, does this fish for its body size have a big old eye or a little tiny eye? And what we found was that for uh, the three eye morphology parameters we measured, which was the eye diameter, the axial length, which is just the depth of the eye, and pupil diameter, which again is fixed. Eye size did matter, so fish with bigger eyes were able to see further away. Our next question we wanted to ask is, what does this really mean? Like, what does this mean for a fish in the lake in these turbidity events? So we were asking, how do these changes to the visual environment affect a fish's ability to forage efficiently? Um, so we tested this with consumption rate, which is the number of prey consumed over a period of time. And so uh, what we did here is we had a, well, just a five gallon aquaria. We put a emerald shiner in there with 45 daphnia, and we just let it sit for half an hour, and then we drained the water and counted the number of daphnia that were left. And then we cross-checked that with the number of daphnia we found in their stomach. So we could see in each of these turbidity treatments, again, sediment, algal, and a combination, how, how well are they able to find and consume prey? And we tested fish at both 20 and 40 NTU, so both that moderate and then higher level of turbidity. And our preliminary results kind of show that at, the, at 20 NTU, at that moderate level of turbidity, we're not really seeing a difference in consumption rate from the clear treatment. So they're not really that impeded in this moderate level of turbidity. However, in the higher turbidity, there was a significantly depressed consumption rate. So they're having a harder time finding food. They're less able to find and consume prey items. We also finally uh, wanted to know, well, we know that fish are being highly impacted by these different types of turbidity and that they're very different impacts, but we wanted to know how is this on the ground affecting recreational fishing in Lake Erie. So how is this affecting the bigger picture? How is this affecting the people that rely on fishing in Lake Erie? So there's a lot of stuff out there. I know a lot of the fishermen have their preferred choices of what types and colors of lures fish see better in types of water. Uh, Big Joshi has a lot of um, pamphlets out there about in dirty water you should use this color for this fish. And a lot of this is based on how light penetrates underwater. A lot of it is based on uh, just anecdotal evidence. But we really wanted to ground truth. What are fish seeing in the water and what's attractive to them? What are they able to see in different environmental conditions? So we took this question, how do these fish see, to the Lake Erie Charter Boat Association. Um, and we, we gave them a survey and we asked them, like, how does turbidity affect your fishing practices, and does it? Um, we actually had a really high response rate. Um, we had about 50 charter captains respond to our survey. 
And most captains say, well, yeah, we fish in high turbidity plumes, we fish in algal blooms, but we don't personally fish if there's an algal bloom. So a lot of charter captains, they choose to fish when there's high sediment suspension in the water. They choose not to fish during algal blooms, but they do believe the fish are there. So most of them responded that they think the fish are still in those algal blooms, but they just don't want to fish there because they kind of think it's icky, which I get. Um, they also told us that pink and gold are their preferred colors across the board for catching walleye. However, 42% of them say they switch lure colors and algal blooms because pink and gold aren't really that effective. However, they didn't really have any consensus of which color they choose. So I'm pretty sure of the 42% that, that said they switched lure color, not a single one of them said they switched to the same color. So um, then we wanted to ask, you know, well, what color are fish seeing underwater? What color lure are walleye able to perceive as food underwater in these algal bloom conditions? So we developed a mobile phone application. You can get it in the, I, the Apple Store or Google Play Store. Um, it's called the Walleye Tracker. Um, and last year it was used by 17 charter captains, and now we have 23 captains, and we've expanded to recreational fishermen that are using this app and collecting data for us on what lures are most effective in what types of environmental conditions. Uh, so what we do is we give our captains this handy measuring board. Um, it has some silly information like the Lake Erie record, um, but it also has a color wheel so we can ground truth colors and a place to put the lure. So they'll place the fish and the lure on this board and just take a picture with their phone. Um, the color wheel allows us to correct for cloud cover or light or any other sort of environmental conditions that are happening on the lake. And then they just get on that, submit the picture and they're done. Um, so we collect data such as their boat name, date, depth, cloud cover, water temperature, and then we have them take a picture of the fish and a picture of the lure, or a picture of the lake. They don't have service, it's not a problem, they can just go home and submit this data. When they do submit it on the lake, we do get GPS coordinates for that. So we know where they're catching these fish, so we can also sort of ground truth with uh, observ satellite observations of what's going on in the lake. So what happens when a photo is submitted, I get an email, I get a lot of emails, um, giving us all the information, and then I also get a picture of the lake and a picture of the fish. So we're just getting successes. We're not seeing which lures are not effective, but really we're just wanting to know which lures are the most effective so then we can go in and look at how these lures work in these water conditions. Preliminary results, I can tell you some secrets uh, of the trade. Just for sedimentary turbidity, um, we jury's still out on algal turbidity, but in clear water, it seems that golden pink, those colors of lures that charter captains said they use the most, those are the most successful in clear, nice waters like today, earlier today, it's a little stirred up now. Um, golden pink seem to be the colors to use. When there's moderate levels of turbidity, uh, purple seems to be the lure of choice, the most effective. A lot of this might be due to the contrast between the darker purple and the water. However, when you get up to that high sedimentary turbidity, that chocolate milk color, there's a switch back to gold and also a lot of use of yellow that's really successful. And we're not really sure why that is yet. Um, again, this is just preliminary results from last year, so we have a lot more data to sift through um, to sort of see how these lures are actually changing with different changing conditions. So what does this all mean in the big picture? Understanding visual ecology gives us an idea of the mechanisms by which animals respond to their environment. So if an animal can't sense a stressor, it can't respond, it probably won't persist. And this helps us answer questions about how these animals are coping with this massive anthropogenic change that's happening all over the world. So once we kind of know how fish are responding visually to this turbidity, we can also sort of help in conservation to be able to you know, ask, are fish going to be able to persist in areas where there's consistent high levels of these turbidity? I'll take questions. <laughs> also, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll get lots of good fish pictures. <laughs> Promise. Questions for Chelsea? 
Yeah. Yeah, so I, I have a, a working theory for that. Okay. Um, so because the Daphnia, they're pretty translucent, pretty clear little dudes, um, a lot of it could be due to the increasing contrast. Um, so low levels of turbidity will increase contrast between the plankton and the background, making them appear like more apparent to the fish. Um, so we think that's why the sedimentary turbidity uh, on the MCU treatment were increased. Uh, they were just more able to see them. Uh, but we didn't really see that in the album, so we're thinking maybe uh, the contrast wasn't as great. In those Anything from the literature? Yeah, so that's, it's been seen in a lot of other uh, more turbidity tolerant fish, and a lot of planktivores. They're more able to see these Daphnia. Um, there's some work done on eye size of the Daphnia, and Daphnia with bigger eyes contrast less with the moderate turbidity, so they're harder to see. So the more, I think it's the more translucent the Daphnia are, the easier it is for that contrast to be apparent. Could it be that the Daphnia can't see the, like they're not avoiding the predator as well as the <laughs> Yeah, so um, there's not really a lot of work on Daphnia being able to avoid predation. <laughs> <laughs> How surprising. <laughs> there is a lot of work on um, like Emerald Shiner being able to avoid predation, so increases in turbidity will decrease their ability to school, and it will also decrease their perception of risk. So they will think they're sheltered, they'll think they're safe, but then you co in comes a walleye who can still see in that turbidity, and he just chomps down. Also, Daphne are usually using um, the chemicals to, to avoid predation as opposed to the actual predation. Yeah. So this is like the, the fisherman talking, no, I guess. So a lot of, uh, personally, I've never had success with this, but some walleye fishermen go out in the middle of the night and catch walleye. So apparently vision is probably not all that critical for the stuff like that. So walleye are crepuscular feeders, dawn and dusk. Um, they're primarily visual foragers. They do have some other methods that they use to find prey, but predominantly visual foragers. They do, because they have those low light adaptations, they're still pretty good at seeing at night if it's not really turbid. Um, so they're still they're still using vision a bit. Uh, it might be more of a contrast thing instead of a color thing when they're fishing at night. Or a movement thing. Yeah. So another fisherman fishing question. Um, I know you said you want to see the difference in the colors based on the water turbidity. Did you notice a difference in like so when we went walleye fishing, mm -hmm. we, you know, we throw um, some fire tigers for being made chartreuse and orange and black. Did you notice a lot for the amount of contrast that was being used? Yeah, so we have in a lot of the, and this is very preliminary, we haven't gone through the data, a lot of the algal turbidity data, we are seeing a lot of uh, copper and white lures, okay. um, just because that contrast becomes maybe a little bit more apparent in the green. Um, and also there's a lot of those dark purple and black lures that are really successful. Uh, so we do think maybe there is something with the two contrasting colors. Uh, however, when it gets up, when the turbidity gets up above those detection thresholds, the fish can't see them. Um, and if they're kind of the same color as the algae, it might cause problems, but it might also increase contrast. We're just not really sure. Uh, we're in the future going to be doing work on actually what the walleye is capable of seeing. So we're actually going to look at their cones and their rods and see what colors of light they can actually see, which will also help sort of ground truth what colors they're seeing in the water in the future. Yeah. So for the walleye tracker results, do you think the, the clear water pink and gold is just because that's that's like, they said, like they, that they said that's what they use, so that's all they're using? Or do you think that, do you get the sense that you know, the, and I'm, I'm not like a lake fisherman at all, so I don't know what, what's typical, but do you think they switch lure colors and play around, or do you think they're always using that when it's clear? I, it depends a lot on the captains. Um, we have one captain, he will only use gold irideries. It's the 
only thing he will fish for walleye with. Um, we have other captains that are switching them up every day. A lot of times they'll switch if it's a slow day. They'll just start switching lure colors just to get more fish on, to get clients more happy. Um, so there is a good amount of switching. We also have other captains that hate gold and will never use it. So um, I think that there are a lot that just use gold. I think that's kind of the gold standard for Lake Erie. <laughs> Sorry, that was terrible, but I love it. <laughs> Um, but I think that there's enough variation that we're actually getting like pretty solid results and that maybe, you know, because gold and pink are the most successful, those are the ones that captains sort of use. Um, we're using a lot of traditional, not traditional, but anecdotal knowledge from the captains because they've been doing this for 50 years and so they, yeah. they kind of know what's going on. So we're able to use a lot of what they've learned in their experience to sort of ground truth what we're learning with our research. I would think it would function more as if in a sediment plume. So the, the algal tuberity we tested in the lab was uh, it was blended spinach, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, so it's just like that really bright green color. We also mixed in some spirulina to get sort of that blue green happening. Um, what we're using on the walleye tracker to, to kind of ground shoot that is we're using pixel percent pixel coloration. So we're looking at each photo that we get and seeing percent gray, percent brown, percent green, so that we can see if it's more on the algal or sediment or in between part of the spectrum. Um, so it's really hard to get charter captains to take, 23 charter captains to take turbidity samples, um, and then when we get them, we just don't have, you know, we can't get them in time to see what's going on. So we're using the photos as kind of a proxy, so we're not able to be like really exact on uh, the type of turbidity we're getting, but I would I would imagine those would be more towards the sediment turbidity, that like browner, decreasing light intensity, <laughs> not really shifting wavelengths of light. A lot of things with the guide on also have a slow leg. A lot of the traffic points are pretty slow. So it might be more of a like combination type, which is another reason why we have listed that is because we know that you know it's not going to be just one or the other in the Some of the uh, lures I've seen for walleye fishing are insane in terms of the color combinations. Like it looks like a blue with a spot of that would be something that might attract the fish. So I'm the one I'm thinking of is like a white lure with polka dots of every color. Mm -hmm. How do you classify that? So for those, we, we call them multicolors. And we actually, again, do the thing with the pixels where we count. Uh, we cut out the lure and we count the number of pixels of different colors. So we, we try to get you know, predominantly this color. If there's a contrasting color, we do that. We do have some captains that use UV lures that we can't really capture, so we have them note that they're your UV lures. But I'm not going to promote UV lures because, well, I can't see UV. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing that out so there. So don't waste but your money. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried to tell them that while I can't see UV and they don't believe me um, at all. <laughs> True though, can't see UV. They're not going to tell them that we can't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of them think UV just means glowy. <laughs>
I forgot to ask you your background of all your different degrees with Chelsea. But um, just like with Chelsea, like we said, we've asked all of our speakers to kind of, um, besides just introducing themselves then and telling you where he got his uh, degrees from, he can give you an idea of how he got to where he is today. Um, again, to provide you guys some perspective of uh, some of these, these people that you're going to meet throughout your time with us and um, allow you to learn about their experiences as you start your journey. Welcome, Steve, Dr. Spears. Thanks, Krista. And, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the invitation to come up here. Um, it's really cool. I've, I've never been up here, and this is only the second time. Um, I've only been in Ohio for not even two years. It's the only second time I've been um, in the vicinity of Lake Erie. And right now, I'm right in the middle of it, so that's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, so my life story in a nutshell. So um, I got into science and ecology and conservation because I grew up as a little kid catching snakes and frogs and um, and I don't know why I was so obsessed with them. My family certainly wasn't, but I was. Um, and so I was, as a kid, like, well, what can I do that will let me go still catch snakes and frogs and things like that? And so science was a way into that. Um, and so I did my, my undergrad at University of Richmond, go spiders, um, uh, in, in Virginia, uh, which is where I grew up. And I got to, while I was an undergrad, I got to work in a lab um, essentially all four years I was there, which is really cool. Um, my main projects revolved around tadpole morphology, which I discovered morphology was not necessarily what I wanted to do for my career, but it gave me a lot of good research experience in that lab. I got to go to a couple of the national herpetology meetings. It, it, it got me, you know, that, that first step into realizing what research was like. Uh, and so after I finished my undergrad, I knew, well, the next step in becoming a scientist is grad school. Um, so I was looking for master's programs, uh, and all I knew is I wanted to work on something related to reptiles or amphibians, and that had some relevance to ecology or conservation, and, conservation, and that was about it. So I uh, looked at a bunch of different schools, a bunch of different potential professors and projects, and ended up going out to Idaho State University um, in southeast Idaho, which I knew nothing about previously, except that when I visited, the professor that became my advisor said, I really would like a student to work on tiger salamanders in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and I was like, okay, I, I want to work in Yellowstone too. Um, <laughs> so, so I started a project uh, doing radio telemetry of tiger salamanders, uh, where basically the point of the project was to understand how they used uh, uh, the uplands after they bred, because tiger salamanders are a group of salamanders that spend most of their time underground um, in the uplands uh, outside of breeding season. And the telemetry basically tanked uh, because they'd go underground and I would lose the signal entirely. Um, so I, I literally spent an entire summer walking circles around Yellowstone National Park, um, which, you know, I guess there are worse ways to spend the summer, but it doesn't get you very far in your graduate degree. So it was kind of like the first, my first big challenge in science because I had to figure out, okay, well, how am I going to get a thesis done? Uh, and I, I wanted to keep with the same general type of project, same general type of questions, um, but clearly I had to figure out another way to, to do that. Um, and so at the same time I was learning about population genetics and this new field called landscape genetics, uh, which is, is basically essentially looking at estimates of gene flow and then correlating that with environmental attributes. And so while I had to increase my scale a bit, I wasn't just looking around a few breeding ponds, I was looking across the whole northern range of Yellowstone, I actually was able to look at over a number of generations what affected the movement of salamanders just inferred through gene flow and, and found that it, it got some really cool results. Like we, we could see a signature of the Yellowstone fires, um, the regeneration after that on, on salamander gene flow, which actually facilitated gene flow, and a few other uh, factors. And that kind of led um, me into my PhD where I con continued working on landscape genetics, this time with uh, tailed frogs, which is a um, endemic species in the Pacific Northwest and forests. I was looking at different types of disturbance. I got to sample around Mount St. Helens, post-eruption, um, logged areas, uh, areas with big fires, that sort of thing. Um, so that's really kind of was my gateway into figuring out the kinds of things I wanted to work on. And one of the, the nice advantages of kind of stumbling upon the landscape genetics field is that it really required me to learn a variety of skills. So obviously I had to learn population genetics and, and thereby lab techniques. Um, which I didn't have a lot of experience in before grad school. Uh, all of my work involved field sampling, so I had to figure out, okay, where am I going to sample? So learned about sampling design and, and those sorts of things. 
And with the landscape part, I did a lot of GIS modeling. So it introduced me to, um, well, GIS, but also sort of quantitative modeling approaches. And I've been able to take aspects of that and, and apply it to projects I've done since, uh, even if it's not strictly landscape genetics. Um, so I finished my PhD. I really, so I, I work, well, at a zoo now, um, a nonprofit organization, but I didn't really know exactly what I was going to do after I finished my PhD. I kind of assumed I would go um, into academia one way or the other, and so I, I was looking for a postdoc. But um, for personal reasons, I wanted to stay around the Idaho-Washington area. Uh, and long story short, uh, a project looking at both GIS modeling and population genetics of rattlesnakes popped up that I'd be working for a nonprofit organization um, called the Orient Society, but I'd be based out, I'd be able to work out of the lab at the University of Idaho, which is where I wanted to be. It was a nice arrangement, but it also opened the door for me in the nonprofit world. And after that rattlesnake project ended, um, I, was, uh, I was offered a spot with, with Orient Society working on additional projects, um, including snot otters, uh, hellbenders, um, and, and some other projects as well, like Bushmasters down in Central America and, and a few other things. And so that really is what launched me into the nonprofit world. Um, it was more opportunity and cool projects um, rather than me actually knowing where I wanted to be. And I found that I actually enjoyed um, a lot of the aspects of working for um, a nonprofit conservation organization. Um, and then when the job at the wilds opened up, I knew a little bit about the wilds because my predecessor in this position um, was also a hellbender biologist, well, still is. He's just now in West Virginia. Um, and we had actually talked um, about some of the environmental DNA work that, that I'll talk about in a few moments. And I knew they had the Head Starting program. So it was really, it was a good opportunity. Um, the wild is a combination of a zoo and a field station. So to get to do lots of field ecology projects, but also combine that with ex situ work, um, which I'll talk about. And so that, that seemed really compelling. Uh, and, and so now I'm at the wild. So in a nutshell, that's, that's how I ended up where I am. Um, so I'm going to talk today about some of the different, kind of a, a, a quick tour of some of the different wildlife projects that, that I'm doing at the wilds. Um, as the title slide kind of gives away, a lot of the focus is going to be on hellbenders and this cool beetle, beetle here, the American bearing beetle, but I'll also touch on a few other things. But I first got to uh, start with this slide. So if you know, the, if you know anything about the wilds, um, this is probably more of what you know about rather than what I'm going to talk about. Um, so this is not what I, my job is and not what I get to do on a regular basis, but I, I get to go watch them if I want to. Um, and uh, these are some of the babies we have this year. So we have dull puppies. Um, we have uh, African painted dog puppies, which this is shortly after they're born in their den box. Now they've grown up quite a bit and rambunctious if you go to visit. Uh, Takin, which if you've never heard of a Takin, are wonderful goat antelope, weird things that um, quickly be become anyone who's, who comes across them, one of their favorite animals, and um, there's some Takin babies. Uh, and so this is my wild tourism hat for a moment, um, and then transition to I'm going to talk about none of this because those aren't the critters that, that I work on, but they're all, all very neat, of course. Instead, what my focus is is more of the legacy of why the wilds is the wilds and why we have 10,000 acres to have exotic animals and field studies and so on and so forth. And that's because the wilds, uh, not too long ago, looked like a giant moonscape. Uh, it was a surface mining site from the 1940s to uh, the 1980s. And this piece of equipment, the big muskie, um, was what did, did all of this uh, um, impressive damage here. So there's the big musky. Uh, is the, at the time the largest, largest drag line um, on Earth. The, uh, the big musky itself has been disassembled. Uh, they realized it would be way more expensive to move it than to just disassemble it where it was. Um, and, uh, but the bucket is, is in a roadside uh, park near the wilds. And so if you're ever in the area, it's, it's worth taking a look at, I guess. It's the, the bucket, you can fit a school bus in there. Gigantic. Um, and, and scraped off much of the earth at the, at the wilds. Um, and so, but it doesn't look like a moonscape anymore, fortunately. And this, this is the rough outline of the wilds. Um, and I'm going to go into a lot more detail on this, but one thing that should catch your eye is there's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, in particular, you can see down here, open areas, and up here, more forested. And, uh, and here are the stats on that. 
So 90% of the landscape was mined. Uh, our 10%, what we lovingly call our remnant forest, um, even though they're, they're certainly not true remnant, but remnant compared to the mining, um, were areas on hills where it just it was, would have been too expensive to, to dig all that up to get to the coal. So those spots were spared, um, but essentially serve as little mini refuges for a lot of the species we have now. Uh, so uh, we have about half the acreage in grassland. Um, grassland's not the historic condition at the wild or in eastern Ohio, um, but when you reclaim after the mining, uh, you, there's a lot of soil compaction. They try and get the contours as they were before, uh, and it's, it's really hard to grow trees. And so it de facto becomes a grassland. There's not much succession happening um, in these parts of the areas because the soil just really won't support trees. However, we do have um, a little over uh, a third of the area that's still forest, uh, particularly in our northern property. And the reason for this is this is before there were laws uh, regarding reclamation of surface coal mines. So they're basically abandoned mine lands. Uh, the, the advantage of that is we actually have forest because the, the soil wasn't compacted and, and contoured. The disadvantage is there's a lot of acid mine drainage up there. Uh, so, you know, when you're dealing with these sorts of things, uh, there's both positives and negatives. And just to give you an idea of the scope, this here are the animal pastures. So if you go to the wilds, you take a tour, and you do nothing else, this is the only part of the site you're seeing, um, and this is the entire property. So this is my playground um, versus just that. So like I said, I'm going to talk about a number of the different programs that I have going on. Uh, we really have two focal species, and by focal species, I mean these are species that we're doing both field conservation, ex situ conservation. Um, you know, I, I spend a lot of my time thinking about multiple elements of, of trying to uh, conserve and recover these species, and that's the hellbender and the bearing beetle. So like I said, most of what I'll talk about is on these two species. Um, but I'm also going to end the, the talk by kind of giving a real whirlwind tour of some of the other cool projects we have um, going on at the wilds. And one thing, I have, a, I have a slide to get into to, I guess, formally thank them. One thing I should acknowledge up front is the reason any of this gets done is because we have some great, we call them apprentices, but basically interns, great interns at the wilds. And it's the only reason I, I get, you know, most of this done, because the wildlife ecology department, it, it sounds, sounds fancy, but I'm, I'm the only full-time staff. I have a technician, and then we have an awesome internship program. So a lot of what I'm talking about, they're the ones that are actually, you know, collecting the data um, and, and making this, this possible. Um, and so it's also, uh, you know, for anyone here that might be interested in, in any of the things I talk about, uh, we have an internship program. So I'll start with our focal species and the eastern hellbender, a.k.a. snot otter, a.k.a. old lasagna sides, um, <laughs> a.k.a. grampus, uh, the largest uh, salamander in North America, at least by mass. Um, not by length, but, but they're big, um, they're ancient, they're pretty awesome. Um, and uh, hellbenders, unfortunately, are not doing well. Uh, this, I found this online. I think it was like an undergrad at the Cal Academy of Sciences. I use it because it just cracks me up. Um, if you read like the little legend here. Uh, so original range, no more hellbenders with the, uh, with the corresponding frowning hellbender. Um, and then happy hellbenders, their current range. This isn't entirely accurate, as anyone who's familiar with hellbenders can, can readily pick out, because if you took this literally, uh, we would have no more hellbenders in Ohio um, and any of these striped areas. That, that's not the case. We still have some hellbenders in Ohio. But it gets to the point that these striped areas, by and large, are where hellbenders are not doing well. And uh, a high percentage of historic sites, you either don't find hellbenders anymore or you just find big old hellbenders. And while finding a two-foot hellbender is an awesome experience, Chris and I were just talking about, you know, those experiences of finding that big hellbender, you get the, the nice photo. Uh, it's actually much more exciting to see the little guys because when we're only finding big hellbenders, hellbenders live uh, several decades. Um, the conservative estimate is 30 to 50 years, but most people think um, that, they can, that they can live longer than that. Um, so if all you're finding is big adults, that's possibly decades where there hasn't been successful reproduction. Uh, and that's why we do a lot of the head starting, as, as I'll talk a little bit more. Um, but because these guys have such long generation times, it takes eight to ten years, up to eight to ten years to become adults. 
uh, is something where we can find some and then all of a sudden they'll be gone and we probably have a lot of essentially functionally extinct populations, uh, at least without um, any sort of intervention. And so unfortunately that describes a lot of the striped area. Now there are you know, there are a handful of good reproducing sites in, in, um, in this area, but, but you can easily count um, you know, good sites in Ohio on, on one hand. Uh, and in general, they, they seem to be doing fairly well in these darker red areas, although I'll, I'll show you um, some data from down here that it's, it's not all uniform. So, you know, why? So hellbenders, they, they live in rivers or large streams, um, and the adults and in, in, in younger age or uh, mid-sized hellbenders will live typically under really big rocks. Um, if you if you go in a stream and you see a rock that's like yay big and maybe about that thick and most of it's in there, but you can kind of see a little space, that's like the perfect hellbender home. Um, and you know, if you're in good habitat and you lift that up, almost certainly there'd be, be a hellbender underneath. Um, the larva, you know, when, when hellbenders are born, they're just, you know, little, little larva, look like little tadpoles. Um, they probably go down into the cobble, although we really don't know a ton about what the, the larvae do. But that's our assumption, because if they go underneath the big rocks, they'll probably be a snack for either the bigger hellbender or crayfish or fish or, or something like that. So they probably go down to that cobble. But the point is they need spaces in the bottom of streams. Um, they, need, they need rivers and streams that are well oxygenated. Uh, so hellbenders have lungs, but they live on the bottom of rivers, so that's not particularly useful. They, except the larvae have gills, but after a year or two, they no longer have gills, so they're breathing through their skin. 90% of their oxygen comes through their skin. Um, that's why they have those the old lasagna sides, the lasagna noodles. They're basically increasing surface area in the skin. Um, so they also need uh, good dissolved oxygen in, in the rivers, and so they're not going to be um, in areas with, with low amounts of that. So siltation is the number one problem for hellbenders um, because it is filling in all of those spaces, both in the cobble and also, um, in extreme cases, burying the large rocks. Uh, and, and across the board, the erosion siltation um, is, is the biggest problem. There's, of course, other insults. Um, dams uh, aren't great for them. Uh, I mean, obviously it fragments habitat, but hellbenders don't move around a ton, so that, that probably isn't the worst part of it, but it turns a river into a lake. And so it, this is no longer going to be suitable for a hellbender where historically it might have been. I mean, there's, there's reports, historic reports, of, say, hundreds of hellbenders in the Ohio River. Um, now they're, I mean, you could probably find one here or there, but they're not hellbender, sustainable hellbender populations in the Ohio River because the Ohio River is more lake than river now. Um, obviously, pollution is not going to be good for amphibians in general, um, including hellbenders. Disease, perhaps. Uh, we really don't have a good handle for if disease is, is affecting hellbenders. These, these uh, photos are from the Ozark hellbender, which is a subspecies in Missouri where they commonly find individuals basically with limbs looking like they're rotted off. Um, and when they swab these, they find a cocktail of different potential pathogens, including chytrid fungus, which is um, one that's hit amphibians hard. Uh, with eastern hellbender sampling, we find chytrid fungus fairly commonly. It's kind of all over our waterways now, but there's, there doesn't seem to be obvious effects. There's not mass die-offs from chytrid. Now, whether there's sublethal effects is, is a different question. So disease is always one of those things people throw out with hellbenders, but at least doesn't seem to be um, the number one problem, if, if at all. And then, and I think this is, fortunately, this is less of a big deal these days, but, you know, human interactions and human persecution. Um, there's a lot of myths around hellbenders. Uh, they're thought to be, at least uh, historically, and still some people, poisonous. Um, they were thought to really decimate trout populations. Uh, neither of these are true. I mean, I wouldn't recommend licking a hellbender. They do produce secretions that don't taste good, but they're not going to kill you. Um, and while I'm sure they'll eat some baby trout, they, if anything, the trout have more of an impact on them than vice versa. Uh, so you don't hear as many stories about people bashing hellbender heads in when they come across them, um, although I certainly have, have seen hellbenders on the bank with their heads bashed in um, on some surveys. But these days, if, if there's human-induced mortality, I mean, beyond the indirect things like siltation, um, it's, it's more accidental from, from fishing. They are caught um, uh, by, by fishermen in rivers. And in fact, that's how we get some of our observations of, of new sites. Um, and most of the time, you know, especially if you know, the fisherman cuts the line, they're probably fine. But this is in North Carolina. We, 
we're doing larval surveys, we saw this individual and we pulled them up, um, had a hook in there. I think this is pretty minor. If this was all that was happening to them, they'd be totally fine. So going back to, you know, our map of, of hellbender declines or, or so forth, um, of course, the first thing is trying to figure out where, before we can, we can do things to try and overturn these declines, is figuring out, okay, where are they doing well? You know, where are the red areas? Where are the striped areas? Um, and what are the patterns of distribution over time? And finding hellbenders is fun, but at least the traditional way is fun, but it's really hard work. Um, and it's, it's really hard to do an effective job beyond a few focal sites. And that's because this is a typical um, way you find hellbenders. They live under large rocks, so you gotta look under large rocks. Uh, so, and, and usually there's just a small entranceway to that rock, so you have to lift it up. So this is an example, this is from North Carolina, but could work anywhere. So we have a couple of guys with log PVs um, lifting up this rock, and two very trusting people sticking their arms underneath the rock while they're holding up with a log PV. Um, it can be dangerous. There's, I've had colleagues who have broken limbs um, by having rocks fall on them that have slipped off the PV or someone has accidentally dropped. I've had a rock dropped on my arm and fortunately my arm was okay. Um, and the other downside is that since you're pulling the rock up, um, you're breaking out some of that sedimentation and when you put it down, you're, you're having more entrances than you had before. And while it's not to say that it, a hellbender can't live under that, it's not as nice. Um, but it is, if you're going to get your hands on a hellbender, it's obviously the way um, that you have to do it to get demographic information. But if we're trying to go across and see what the current distribution is over a larger area, it's not necessarily the most efficient. So, but, you know, this isn't something that people are going to see walking on, on the stream bottom. That there, aren't, there weren't a lot of options to, to try and survey for them. Uh, but 10 years ago, a paper came out uh, from France, looking at American bullfrogs that are invasive in France, just like they're invasive in a lot of places, and they were trying to figure out the distribution of this invasive species. Um, and uh, they decided, well, they came out of a genetics lab. They thought, well, let's, let's sample the water and see if we can get any bullfrog DNA out of the water um, without having to go catch bullfrogs. And uh, so they took a little bit of water, centrifuged it down, extracted from um, what was spun down, and they found that at high densities of bullfrogs, based on their surveys, they, uh, they almost every time found bullfrog DNA from just a small amount of water. Uh, more interestingly, at low densities, and their low densities, I think, were like one or two bullfrogs per pond, again, based on field surveys, uh, it wasn't every single time, but they commonly could pick up bullfrog DNA, especially if they ran it two or three times. And importantly, at sites where, based on surveys, they were pretty sure there were no bullfrogs, they didn't get any positives, suggesting that this just wasn't something where, you know, you were having DNA contamination everywhere. Um, so this paper really launched the field of eDNA, aquatic eDNA for vertebrates, and uh, I imagine folks up here might at least be perfectly familiar with it. Uh, Asian carp um, have become a huge uh, study organism for eDNA um, around the Great Lakes, uh, but really all sorts of things. Um, and there have been a lot of folks, uh, including myself, uh, with, with hellbenders and a few other species, but lots of different species where people have um, used eDNA, so taking a sample of water. Um, in this case, instead of spinning it down, I'm filtering it, and you know, there's a whole host of the aquatic community you could potentially pick up. And you could even pick up like semi-aquatic things, like a deer drinking um, out, of a, out of a river. If it's, if it's common enough, you can pick up DNA from that saliva. And of course, the great thing about this is that unlike other types of environmental DNA, like scad or hair, um, or feathers, you don't actually ever have to find any sign of the animal. You just have to go to the water body and, and sample from it. And for something like a hellbender, if we're just trying to at least initially get presence absence, it's, it's pretty clear why this, this could be really nice compared to other survey techniques. I'm not going to go right now into all the details of environmental DNA sampling and um, designing primers and how it, the, the genetic details. I'm would love to talk with anyone afterwards if you're interested in it, but in, in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about the methodological details, but I'm going to show you an example of what we've been able to do using um, eDNA. So my previous job with Orient Society, I was based out of Georgia, so these are the Southern Appalachians. Um, here's Georgia, here's most of Tennessee, that's Nashville, 
Um, here's Western North Carolina, so Asheville, somewhere around here. Um, so this is in the red area of happy hellbenders. And uh, this is over uh, three years of going and getting eDNA samples um, with myself and, and collaborators. Uh, and there's no way, they haven't, they've been doing, North Carolina's been doing a 10 year uh, snorkel survey program and um, they haven't even in 10 years been able to hit this number of sites. So from that end, a lot, a lot more efficient. Um, and the stars are positive, the X's are negative. Uh, and it allows us to see um, patterns across a broad extent uh, that match up with some of uh, the, the things that we've been seeing at, at, at finer scales. So Middle Tennessee, based on a few sampling sites, they've noticed hellbenders declining there rapidly. And unfortunately, our eDNA surveys really bore that out. Um, you see a few stars, but it's almost all X's in Middle Tennessee, which historically would have been all hellbenders. We see a higher density of stars in this area, which is the, you know, the red area on that, that range map, but we're also seeing a lot of X's in between there. Um, and, uh, and so we're seeing smaller declines within with overall you know, distribution where they still are, but certainly some areas where hellbenders do appear, um, like in, in this area here, um, around here, where there still seem to be good hellbender populations. So a question that comes out of you know, any sort of survey technique especially something that, you know, where you're just taking water and, you know, the, the sight unseen part of it is, okay, um, that's great, but what's your detection rate, what's your detection probability, um, you know, putting it in some sort of, like, occupancy model. And so this is an example of a project. Um, it was a master's thesis of Appalachian State that uh, I was, uh, I'm a co-author on, um, and I, uh, the student sampled multiple sites in North Carolina. They went to, he went to the sites three times, did both uh, snorkel surveys and eDNA. Uh, and so we were looking at what factors affected detection. Um, and so what we found was that uh, overall detection probability was 0.9 for the Hellbender eDNA um, surveys, which is really high. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it appears to be, at least for Hellbenders, a, a fairly detectable method. Um, and what was interesting is that at pretty low concentrations of DNA, when we quantified the amount of DNA, um, your, your detection goes basically to one. So what that's telling us is that you don't need to have a lot of environmental DNA present to, have, to, to be able to, to pick that up, um, which is, is really useful because you're not expecting high concentrations of DNA in the environment. Um, and there were some other things like larger hellbenders, which makes sense. They're probably going to shed more eDNA. Um, there was an interesting result with the percent sand uh, because you would expect more sand to be worse for hellbenders because that's going to represent more fine sediments that are going to fill in those spaces. So I wonder if that's something where the sand might be binding to DNA or something like that. That's, that's something we're interested in. Um, but overall, it appears, at least for hellbenders, um, the technique is that this map that I showed before, that this probably is, is a relatively accurate representation of current trends, that we're not having a lot of false negatives. Probably a few, but, but certainly not a ton. Um, now, this isn't the case for every single system, and it's very system dependent. I'm also doing some eDNA with mud puppies, uh, that their detection is, is definitely a lot lower than, than something like a hellbender. So now I'm up in Ohio, and there's a few places in Ohio that um, have been pretty well studied for hellbenders. Um, uh, Greg Lips has done um, a ton of work in, in, in Ohio, but there's also some places where there just isn't a lot of survey work, um, where folks haven't gotten to as much. And it happens, one of those places happens to be um, really near the wild, so the wild uh, somewhere yeah, right there, um, in the Muskegon River drainage, and to a degree the Hocking River drainage. We know historically hellbenders would have been all through here, um, there's, a few help, there's a few sites where we know hellbenders are, um, but overall it hasn't been well surveyed. So what I'm starting to do, and we did a preliminary survey um, with one of my interns last year, is start to hit some of the sites that we think could be promising in this drainage. So last year we chose some sites that, based on EPA data, um, had really nice water quality, really high IBI um, indexes for, for macroinvertebrates and, and fish, and thought, well, that could be good places for hellbenders. And so we took some eDNA samples, and what we found, so the, the orange dots are where we, we got, uh, none of our replicates were positive. Um, the yellow was uh, one of our three replicates were positive, so suggest uh, 
a weak signature, which means maybe they're a little bit upstream. upstream. And then the, um, uh, the uh, green one, uh, we had uh, two out of the three positive. Um, so that gave us, in these two um, river drainages, some idea that we may have some sites that at least we haven't known about for a while um, that, that we can then focus in on and really try and take multiple samples along that stretch of river, as well as a few other sites that, that folks have reported citing that, to really try and nail down, is it just you know, a big adult um, that it's, it's a functionally extinct population, or are there some spots where they're still reproducing in this drainage that we don't know about? Uh, and uh, it looks like we're going to get some funding through Fish and Wildlife Service this summer to really drill down in these areas and, and take multiple samples along the stream um, to see where we get um, higher concentrations. And that's, yeah, that's one thing that, that's a, a weakness of eDNA, at least at this point, is that it, it can be really good for presence absence, but in our case, we're talking about large hellbenders that you, know, you may not have breeding for a number of decades. Uh, we can pick up that large hellbender, so that's a positive, but it doesn't mean it's a sustainable site. And so there's been a lot of work with eDNA in general looking at um, estimating the amount of eDNA you get and correlating that with, with densities. And in some systems, that seems to work fairly well. So far, we haven't um, seen that work uh, super well with hellbenders, so we're still trying to fine tune that. Uh, and, and trying to look for a long river corridor, see if you have peaks of, of eDNA um, quantity along that, um, along that gradient may help us uh, better figure some of that stuff out. Um, we've also done eDNA surveys in western Ohio. So this is an area historically hellbenders would have been, but there have not been any verified observations for a long time. Uh, so this was, again, this is also with Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, last fall, they collected from 80 different sites across western Ohio. And unfortunately, um, none of them were positive for hellbenders, suggesting that they probably are extirpated from Western Ohio. Uh, even additionally concerning, although this was kind of a side question, but as I mentioned, I also do some mud puppy DNA, and I run both the hellbender and mud puppy in the same reaction. Uh, only, I believe, four of these sites were positive for mud puppy, um, where you would expect mud puppy to be much more abundant. So it suggests that those guys might be declining in lag behind hellbenders. Um, so that's some of the eDNA work I've done, trying to figure out where they are. Um, but that only, you know, tells us the distribution or and that sort of information. It, it's not obviously <coughs> actually uh, creating any sort of management actions for to improve hellbender populations. Um, one of the nice things about being in the wild is that I also have the mechanism to, to work on some aspects of that. And in particular, we have a our hellbender conservation center, which is a head starting center for hellbenders. So hellbenders are very difficult um, to, uh, to breed in, in a zoo-controlled uh, environment. You really, St. Louis Zoo is doing it, but they have a really nice artificial stream set up that I would love to have at the wilds, but haven't had that donor come to me yet with that, that check. Um, so what we do is, and what in Ohio they do as well, ours, uh, we work in West Virginia with, with this part, is we collect the eggs from the streams, bring them in, raise them up for a few years, until they, they get larger, um, and then release them back into the streams. Uh, and the reason we do this and, and take entire clutches back is that we've seen evidence that you can find eggs in a lot of these, uh, some of these degraded streams, but again, we see no evidence that the larvae survive. So our assumption is that most of these eggs are, are not going to be successful and that we're going to have much higher success, you know, up to 80 to 90 percent um, in, in our head starting facility. And the idea of raising them up for a few years is that once they're bigger, um, they're, they're not going to need to go down that cobble, um, and also they should be a little bit more resistant to predation. Uh, and so this is, this is something that's been going on, I say, in Ohio, um, West Virginia, um, Missouri for a number of years. And uh, so we've got the, a lot of the head starting stuff down. I mean, our survival is really good. Uh, but the next question is, you know, are these head starting releases being successful? Are these hellbenders? then recruiting into the population. And, and that's really an open question right now. I'd love to show you data, but we really don't have it. And there's, there's some good reasons for that. Uh, as I mentioned, they take eight to 10 years to, to uh, become adults. We typically release them at four to five years old, and the head starting <laughs> releases have only been going on for the past few years. So we're probably just now kind of getting to the point where they would be adults in breeding in a population anyway. 
Um, there's been some work uh, with radio telemetry immediately upon release, and that's given us a lot of short-term information, but not, not anything over the time scale that we need. And so a project that I'm involved with working with a graduate student at, at Ohio University, the other Ohio University, um, <laughs> is looking at strategies to try and monitor these, uh, these head starts in Ohio. Uh, we're, we're looking at ways kind of like that the fishery folks have used with wands to pick up pit tags, because all these guys are pit tags. Um, we're investigating ways to um, use eDNA to, to uh, amplify genetically diverse regions so we could see, okay, if we know the genotypes of the ones that we released, if we can then try and reconstitute some of those. Um, and as well as, uh, my next slide? Yeah, as well as using, uh, putting out Hell Bender Nest Boxes as a potential monitoring tool. And so the Hell Bender Nest Boxes are like bluebird boxes for hellbenders, at least that's the hope. Uh, it's obviously artificial rocks that are hollow in there, um, so they, they mimic a natural rock, but you can just take the lid off and observe, and this is from Virginia, but you can see two hellbenders that are actually breeding in, in the artificial shelter. So th there's two hopes for this. One is to provide habitat, um, but the other is to actually be a way to monitor them to get demographic information without having to lift all the rocks up. And so Ohio, um, Greg Lips of Mitch Port in particular is really interested in this, um, but the jury's still out, particularly in, in this part of the range, on how successful they are and what the best strategies for installing them, and, and that's also part of, of this project um, with, with OU as well as other work that um, Ohio folks are doing. But, but this is one of our hopes that this will be um, a tool that we can continue to use um, to, to help monitor and conserve hellbenders. Oops. All right. So shifting to our other focal organism. Um, this is the American bearing beetle. So I fully admit, I had, before I took this job, um, I had never, I had heard of bearing beetles in general, although I couldn't have told you a lot about them other than what their name suggested. Uh, I had never heard of the American bearing beetle, but it's one that I've kind of fallen in love with. I mean, probably not more than hellbenders just yet, but they're still pretty awesome. Um, and uh, they're um, part of a group of beetles called the bearing beetles, and their name kind of implies what they do, but their, their life history and ecology is so much cooler than just bearing stuff, um, although, of course, that's part of it. So bearing beetles, uh, the whole group, and there's a number of different species. The American bearing beetle is the largest of them. Um, they fly around looking for dead stuff. American bearing beetles look for larger dead stuff like rats, quails, that, that kind of size, dove size. Um, the other bearing beetles tend to go for mice or, or smaller rodents. Um, but they, they, they fly around. So this is a, a bucket trap uh, in Nebraska, which is, is one of the, the current populations and where we get our founders from for our work. Um, and so here's a rat that we were using to bait it. Um, but you can see, so these are some American bearing beetles that flew in here, and you can notice the hair is already off to the side. When they find a carcass, um, they'll actually prepare it. So they'll, they'll strip the hair, um, they'll release all these sort of secretions to reduce um, decomposition, and then these little beetles, a, a pair, um, uh, at least one they're gonna use for, for breeding, will uh, dig out underneath the carcass and within a matter of hour, up to as few as as as, as short sure as a few hours, completely bury something. You know that's that's many times their size. Once uh, they get this uh, carcass down there and they prepped it, it it pretty shortly ceases to look like what it was before. In this case, this is a this is a quail that we've used in our breeding bar, so you can they didn't quite prep the the, the wing there. But the rest of this, this is the rest of the quail. It just looks like a ball of mud. Um, the beetles lay their eggs, and these nice white grubs hatch, and so it's an all-you-can-eat you know, buffet for, for these grubs. Um, and I think one of the coolest things of all, um, I'm always intrigued with you know, the so-called you know, lower animals have cool parental care patterns, and uh, the beetles have parental care. So the adults don't just lay eggs and then take off they're constantly moving around the carcass and their larva and tending to the larva. So they're, you know, if a fly comes in and, you know, lays eggs and maggots pop up, they'll eat the maggots, they'll try and fend off anything else, uh, help the larva move around in the carcass. When the larva get ready to go pupate, they'll help dig little tunnels for them to go off. And it's, it's amazing. I've gotten to, when we do larval checks in our, in our breeding barn, 
um, I've gotten to, got to watch this, and they are, they are just constantly moving around. And so I think it's really interesting that you know, this insect has that pattern, at least for a couple weeks, and then once the larva pupated, they take off. So that's general bearing beetle ecology. So why we're interested in the American bearing beetle amongst this whole group is because it is one of the most endangered beetles um, in, in the U.S. or the world. The IUCN has them listed as critically endangered. They're on the Endangered Species Act. Uh, they, in 1989, they were listed. They were actually the first insect to be listed under ESA. Um, and this, this map uh, gives you an idea, especially after I point out um, that the historic range of the American bearing beetle was pretty much the entire eastern United States with the exception of they weren't down in the southeast. But really most, and a little bit into Canada, um, most of this was the historic range of the American bearing beetle. Uh, so a huge range. Um, now, the only places where you have wild populations are this year, so Nebraska, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Texas, Kansas, a population there, and then on an island off Rhode Island called Block Island. Those are the only known wild sustainable populations of American bearing beetles, and that's why they're, they're listed as endangered. Um, so after this happened, zoos started to get involved. Um, uh, the Roger Williams Park Zoo in Rhode Island was the first. Um, they started breeding these beetles, found that they were relatively easy to, to breed at the zoo, um, and then they reintroduced them um, uh, onto Nantucket Island and found that they were starting to see some success of, of beetles there when they would do monitoring. St. Louis Zoo um, got involved and started reintroducing them in southwest Missouri, not too far from um, the Oklahoma, Arkansas population, and it started to have some success there. And we have, along us and the Cincinnati Zoo, um, I would say probably have the, the biggest challenge of all of trying to get them going in a place that's nowhere near um, where, they, where they currently are, and really what would have been one of the central areas in the range. This polygon uh, is, is obviously is way bigger than where we're actually reintroducing them. They're being reintroduced at the wild and at uh, the Fernald Preserve near Cincinnati. So we're, we're not reintroducing them across eastern Ohio, uh, at least not yet. So um, as I mentioned, they turn out to be relatively easy to breed, which is really nice. Um, so we, got, uh, we get founders from, in our case, from Nebraska each year. Um, which is similar latitude to where we are, so we figured that for the winter that might be advantageous. Uh, we get, uh, like last year, we got 10 pairs of beetles from, from Nebraska. Uh, they live just a year, so the generations turn over quickly. Uh, and uh, we're in the middle of our releases, but we're going to um, release uh, over 400 beetles this summer. So that descend from, um, from 10 pairs. So they're relatively easy to breed, high, high survival there. Um, and so the trickier part, of course, is, is getting them reestablished in your field sites. So this is uh, uh, what we do when we're doing an American bearing beetle release. In fact, we have one coming up on Tuesday. Uh, so we give them a little bit of a head start. We dig holes for them so we don't make them do the work, at least to start out. Um, and, of course, we provision them with, with a rat or a quail. Uh, and then uh, we come back and check about 10 to 15% of our holes to see if we're, it looks like we're having success um, two weeks later, which is when the larva should be there. And hopefully we'll see something like this. So there's one of the attending parents um, and, and a bunch of beautiful white beetle larvae. Um, I would sit them back. And this is kind of, we've, we've been doing this, uh, collectively the Wilds has been doing this since 2011. And until last year, this is kind of where it, it uh, stopped as far as our active role. Um, it was more of put them out there and, and hope that, that they would take, but there really wasn't a lot of monitoring, which was mainly due to limited personnel and resources um, and the fact that they saw a larva, they figured, well, some are probably emerging. But when I came on, I was really interested, in, got interested in this program and, and really wanted to see, well, you know, do we have any success? Are there beetles establishing at the wilds? You can probably imagine a bearing beetle is not an easy thing to find. Um, and uh, and uh, it, you really have to sample uh, over a long time with these bucket traps where you, or you can make them pitfall. In our case, we do bucket because it's hard to bury things in our soil. Um, and we put a dead rat, something really stinky, and uh, it's a funnel trap that bearing beetles fly in, and uh, we put these up across the wilds. Uh, and what was really cool is that last year we caught for the first time on site bearing beetles that were born out of our releases. Um, 
And uh, we not only picked them up, we picked them up mostly at our release site, but we also picked up evidence of young beetle dispersal uh, one to two miles away from the release site. Uh, and it's actually giving us an idea of, of the general area where they're going. Um, we've gotten one of the released adults so far this year that's also circling the same area, which is around our bison prairie. So that's telling us that in there might be where they might be going. So we've, now that we started finding them, we marked them with little B tags um, so that if we, we know if we recapture them. Um, one of them we recaptured a couple of times last year, but most of the time, once we capture them once, we don't see them again. Um, and, and one of the big questions is really where are these guys, where are these guys going? Um, right now, we're, we're trapping to try and see evidence of overwintering survival um, to catch one that was born from last year. Uh, we haven't gotten that benchmark yet, but as I said, we're, we're not sure exactly where they're going. Um, and we'll probably we'll be putting more effort in that bison prairie area. Uh, so the jury's still out with these guys as to whether they are establishing at the wild, um, whether we will be successful. Uh, but we're starting to, you know, to, to hit some of those check boxes um, that we would expect to see. Uh, and, and the nice thing about having both the breeding system or the, 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 the breeding barn and the reintroduction all in the same place is it allows us to, to look at a lot of research questions all in the same area. So some things that, that we're looking at um, is quantitative genetics of different morphological traits because we have, you know, all these generations um, where we have all this data from. So uh, my technician, a former apprentice and now technician is working on that. We've been um, doing mark recapture on the closest relative to this beetle, which happens to be very abundant on the wilds, um, and, uh, and trying to infer that as a proxy for where the American survival and where they might be going. So I'm going to, like I said, briefly hit a few other things that um, highlight some of the variety of stuff that we're doing on site. Uh, so as I mentioned, there is the habitat's really heterogeneous. So we have the forested up here that's most largely abandoned mine lands, but actually has some forested species, especially where we have a few of the remnant forest plots, which are the darker greens. There's one there, one there, one there. So they're just small and scattered throughout. And then in the south, we have more of the grassland areas. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in colonization after disturbance. Like so one of my PhD chapters was looking at Mount St. Helens and looking at how frogs handle that disruption. And so I'm, I'm really interested in how these remnant forests um, might be uh, basically seeds for, for, for colonizing the mine forest and why the mine forests are suitable. Um, and amphibians, I think, are really good study species for that, plus the fact that, that I enjoy working with them. But they do tend to be better indicator species for this sort of thing because they don't move around a whole lot. They can't fly long distances like birds. Um, they don't have home ranges that might be the size of the wild, like a bobcat. Um, and they're really dependent on microhabitat conditions. So one of the projects we actually, uh, a Prince project we just wrapped up with our vernal pool amphibians. So on our northern property, we have a number of forested vernal pools. Most of them are on the uh, remnant forest, but we have some on mine forest. And we have some that were actually created a few years ago. And we mostly monitor for Jefferson salamanders and wood frogs, because those are the ones that, that we see the most that are vernal pool associated. Um, and so I had a, a apprentice do an occupancy study, um, and she found a number of these pools that, that had these species. But what was interesting is that the factor that came out most important for occupancy was the, the presence of um, woody debris immediately around the, around the pool. So one of the things we're going to look into next is, is that just a forest condition thing, that the forests that have a lot of debris or, or um, cover objects, wooden, wood cover objects around the pool, tend to be better overall for microhabitat? Or is it something where with like created vernal pools, we can actually increase the, the possibility that amphibians will want to colonize them by putting those uh, um, cover objects around the pool? Um, and we're also uh, looking at terrestrial salamanders and lungless aquatic salamanders. As you could probably well imagine, none of these things would have survived the mining. So any, and their home ranges are tiny. Um, if you don't know a lot about terrestrial lungless salamanders, um, this room would well encapsulate probably multiple home ranges of these guys. They don't move very much, uh, and they're very sensitive to microclimate conditions because they're lungless, but yet they're on land. Um, and so on site, almost certainly any, any ones we have had to come out of the remnant forest. And in fact, that's certainly where we find most of them. So these are ravine salamanders. 
Um, and in our streams, we also have things like dusky salamanders and long-tailed salamanders. And you can imagine these guys are going to be really sensitive to acid mine drainage. So there's been some work uh, in uh, mine lands near the wilds. Uh, these are abandoned mine lands where they've looked at um, unmined versus the abandoned mine land forest and found that, as you might expect, there's more species in the unmined. But this is, in, in that study, um, which again is a, uh, north of the wilds, is entirely attributed to the stream amphibians. They just don't see stream amphibians in the abandoned mine lands, probably because the acid mine drainage that comes with that. But if you look at the species that they do have, surprisingly, the relative abundance is basically the same in that environment. Um, that's really interesting to me because the surveys that we've started to do, and we've just kind of started um, these, so we have a lot of more surveys and area to cover, but where we're finding them, um, these salamanders so far is basically around our remnant forest, um, and only a few examples in the mine forest. So uh, this year, that, that we did last year was more of just flipping cover objects opportunistically. This year, we're, we're uh, starting a study that's much more standardized using salamander cover boards. Uh, and so this year, we're starting in our remnant forest to get a good um, start to get uh, occupancy and relative abundance estimates for what we assume would be the uh, colonization centers. And we'll expand this um, based on our, our remnant forest results in future years to our mine forest and see where they might be recolonizing and, and incorporating uh, uh, microhabitat data loggers like temperature, soil moisture, things like that to sort of figure out what's facilitating, what would facilitate the salamanders to, um, to spread across the property. A few other projects we have going. So we have a camera, a camera trap network across the wilds um, in our, at least our forested areas. So these push bins are all different cameras. Uh, in particular, we're focusing on monitoring our native carnivores. Uh, bobcats were extirpated from Ohio. They're coming back uh, in some areas with a vengeance in the wilds. Uh, is one of the hot spots for bobcats. Um, and, and of course, coyotes have, have spread across the east in general. And what we're finding based on our camera uh, surveys and actually scat surveys is that we have equal observations of bobcat and coyote. Um, so that suggests that bobcats, and we have quite a few of both, which suggests that they're, they're, all doing, they're both doing very well. And we're using that to kind of build on some um, genetic marker capture projects right now. Uh, bats, I, last year we started doing some acoustic uh, monitoring for bats. I had no idea how many bats we might have or, or what, the, what the summer uh, populations might be like. And what we found is that we, had, um, we have a lot of bats on site. Um, these are basically all the transects we were doing. Um, and we've detected evidence um, based on the ultrasonic monitoring for, uh, for all nine species of bats that you might expect there, including Indiana bats, Northern long-eared, and in fact, these are all of the myotis, um, so the little brown, the, the Indiana, the northern long-eared um, observations based on ultrasonic surveys. So it's, it's really encouraging to see that it's in multiple places on site um, and that we might be providing some really nice summering habitat for bats, um, and this is certainly something I'm looking to, to build on, and we're doing uh, additional ultrasonic surveys more targeted this summer. And then finally, um, we put up, this is something you guys might be familiar with around here, ringing Lake Erie. Um, we put up a modus tower at the wilds this year, um, just, just fairly recently. Uh, and so we're, we're looking to start to learn more about what species, what bird species um, are using the wilds um, as migratory corridors or stopovers. In particular, we're working with a, a few other uh, partners on, um, the, uh, with loggerhead shrikes. Um, so far, we've done some work trying to model appropriate habitat in Ohio, uh, but we also want to learn a, a number of loggerhead shrikes are, are tagged with the type of tags that this, this MODIS satellite network, or not satellite, uh, MODIS antenna network will pick up um, and, and trying to learn more about the, the distribution if these guys are using the Ohio landscape, which we have very few observations right now. And uh, with that, I just want to highlight a whole host of partnerships um, that that come along with a lot of the projects I talked about. Obviously, just like any type of science, you can't do it alone. And I'm sure there's some folks that are left off that off that, that should be on there. Um, and again, highlight the our technicians and apprentices that, that come through the wild. Um, they they really, like I said, allow allow us to do what we do and have all sorts of varied types of cool projects. So 
This is, uh, this is from the uh, egg collection surveys last year, so that's the, the poor male that got his nest robbed in West Virginia. Um, and with that, happy to take any questions. No, I mean, in the, in the sites that are well monitored and you do see evidence of recruitment, it's, it's a more consistent thing. They're not, a lot of amphibians do have that, you know, the, the, the boom and bust years. Um, hellbenders, at least ideally, typically are in a more stable environment. Um, and yeah, you'll see, you'll see evidence year after year. Um, and yeah, evidence of egg laying and, and larva in, in the good sites, yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's a good question. Um, and one of the things I didn't really I didn't really go into the reason for declines for American bearing beetle. And part of that is we don't really have a really great idea about why that is. It's more of hypotheses rather than a lot of good data. Um, because as I mentioned there's a lot of other bearing beetles and, and many of them are, are quite abundant, so it's you know, and they have to, to bury stuff as well. So the, the biggest difference between Americans and the other ones is the Americans are larger and they use larger carrion. Uh, and so that's what most of the thought as to why they've declined is related to that. Um, so one hypothesis uh, is that the passenger pigeon extinction was a huge blow to the American bearing beetles because passenger pigeons, uh, particularly their young, like falling out of nests with these you know, gigantic breeding events with the huge flocks, um, would have been really good carrion for American bearing beetles. Um, and certainly other things like uh, white quail, which probably have could, you know, would be the right size, have, have declined, and, and those sorts of things. So it's not really answering your question, but I don't, uh, the, the short answer is I don't know, but it would be, um, but it could um, have something to do with the island having, um, whether it's from, you know, birds going there or other, other sources, um, a good carrying source. But it, it's really, it is one of the things that makes it particularly challenging is, is that we, we don't, have a great idea of what what we need to change beyond maybe some obvious things to, to really help help these guys succeed. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, it, it's uh, it's hard to say, but but I imagine it's, it's something related to that. Yeah. What's the average lifespan of the berry beetle? They just live a year, um, and maybe not even that. Um, the ones that when they start dying off. Um, in, in our summer, the ones that aren't going to be released is about seven or eight months when, when it starts. So it, it, it makes it, from a monitoring perspective, um, it makes it a little bit easier because we know, and they, they're real shiny when they've newly emerged, and when they're older, if they overwinter, they're going to be a lot duller. So we'll know if we catch a beetle if it's newly emerged or if it's an older adult. So from a monitoring perspective, it's nice um, that, that they have that. But Just reproduce once, like a, when a pair finds a, a carrion, and then they will go through their parental care. Will they just do that once within their lifespan, or will they do that twice? Yeah, I think it's not typically it, it happens once, um, especially you know in the more northern latitudes. By the time they're coming out of, like for instance in Nebraska, um, which is the area we probably know the most most about, best studied. Um, you know they don't they don't really emerge till like late May June, late May and June. And it takes two months um, from egg laying to adult emergence. Uh, and so by then, it would be too late in the year to get cold before another brood could emerge. Um, so now what, I don't know if we have, I don't think there's really much data on whether, um, you know, adults would lay a brood, hang around for a couple of weeks, and then leave and, and have another one. We, um, I think the thought is that they 
don't, but we really don't have that data because there's, it's really hard to monitor, you know, individuals over time. Um, so it's possible um, that that happens, but we just don't know. And then, so you said a pair has to come in. Like, how do they find, is like a, a male or female is just find a carcass you, it's like in the, in the wild and then just happens upon each other? Or do they fly together? Or they... Uh, it's probably more as they happen upon each other. Um, they're, they're, they can, they have amazing sensory capacities. I mean, they can sense uh, a, a carcass from a mile away. Uh, wow. So, um, so it's more of going toward that resource. And then there's there's definitely evidence of, um, you know, male competition for for carcasses. And um, so the, the carcass is definitely the center point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, and one interesting thing that we see, um, we actually see a decline down at, as you go further generations. Um, so, for instance, uh, we had, um, from the founders, we had a 100% uh, bucket success. I think we had 12 or 13 buckets from those founders. But, so, so we breed them in, in the summer, uh, and then you know, they emerge in early fall. And then we breed those offspring um, a second time in the winter to have uh, beetles ready for the next year's release. And uh, it was as part of an experiment, we did a lot more buckets. Um, we did 64 buckets, but we only found about 50% um, of those were successful. So it, it, one question that I have, and we haven't addressed it yet, but it, it's something I'd like to get into, is looking at is there evidence of inbreeding depression? Um, just, you know, a couple of generations, particularly when you have a small, small founder um, popu you know, population bringing up the wild, and uh, what that has the influence for our releases, because our releases are then, you know, like the third generation of beetles uh, that, that come out of that. So that, that certainly, if, if there is that issue of, um, of inbreeding within a few generations, that's going to affect our reproduction success. And beyond that, those sorts of anecdotes, we don't, we don't have real good, good data for that. Um, and, and so genetic monitoring could help us help us figure that out. Um, so yeah, uh, I think did that did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm on a wayward side.